Well, 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 well. Thanks, you, Kathy. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. May the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you today as we uh, gather for this very special occasion. This is really about uh, Dr. Samuel uh, Subramanian, uh, who has come to the faculty here, and uh, I think I was invited in large part to be able to uh, bless his ministry among this community and to lift up uh, the valued relationship between uh, the United Methodist Church, particularly the Minnesota Conference and uh, United Theological Seminary in the Twin Cities. So it's a, it's a delight to be here. I wanna thank uh, President uh, Barbara Holmes for the invitation uh, to uh, preach today at this uh, community worship and to participate in uh, the celebration and the dialogue that uh, we will uh, have a bit later over lunch. Um, Samuel has been a, a dear friend and a colleague uh, of mine for many, many years, although there was sort of a gap in our interaction uh, as I was moving around the church. Uh, but uh, we first met each other uh, in the Iowa conference, and so when I learned that he was coming uh, to uh, the Twin Cities, and particularly to United, I was, I was delighted, and I, I hope you are as well. I want to say just a word of uh, appreciation um, to uh, your president, uh, uh, President Holmes. Um, we met a few months ago. She came to my office, walked in, place lit up. Have you noticed that about her? Huh? The, uh, I, just, uh, I just want to affirm the energy that you bring not only to your calling here, but uh, to the tasks here and to uh, the cultural change that uh, you're leading at, at uh, UTS. Um, now, if you all want to express your appreciation along with me, you may do that. <laughs> and also a word of acknowledgement and appreciation to the faculty and uh, administrators and trustees, and students and benefactors. Many of these groups are represented here today. Uh, as I think about each of you, uh, I'm reminded of that, that phrase, that, that saying that many of you have heard, you are the kingdom of God, you are the ones you are waiting for. You are the very ones that uh, God has called to this place. Uh, the focus of my homily this morning is going to be around this uh, notion of being called or chosen uh, by God. Um, I decided to move in this direction uh, based on the text from Isaiah in large part because I knew that um, uh, Dr. Submaranian was, was chosen to be here and that each of you uh, in your respective roles or your place within the community have been chosen uh, by God to be uh, in this place at this time. And so I want to develop that theme with you a bit this morning. Will you uh, pray with me? Lord God, I pray that in these moments your spirit will come and minister to us. You know our needs, you know our hopes, our dreams. You know our desires for this learning community. And so we pray that you would come in and speak to our dreams and our hopes and even to those places of hurt and woundedness that we might be bringing with us this day. Help us to understand how blessed we are to have been chosen by you for the work of your kingdom. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, uh, how many of you remember your baptism? Few, few of you? probably because you were baptized uh, in adolescence or maybe even as an adult. Um, I don't remember my baptism. I was baptized as a child uh, when I was uh, very, very young. But you know, my parents thought it was important for me to uh, know something about my baptism. And I'll, I'll never forget, when I was uh, probably 10 or 11 years old, we were taking a vacation out west, and my parents made a detour to Denver, Colorado, to introduce me to the pastor who had baptized me as an infant in faith, at Faith United Methodist Church in Williston, North Dakota. They, my parents just knew it was important for me to have a connection that I could remember to my baptism. Now, I wish we all could remember our baptism, 
It's one of the reasons I affirm uh, um, our having opportunities within the United Methodist tradition to remember our baptism, services of remembering our baptism. Not just because no, the uh, remembering the act itself, but, but it gives us an opportunity to also remember the vows that, they, that were spoken, either by us or on behalf of us, and the promises that our congregations made to us, or that we as a congregation made to those being baptized. These are the words in our United Methodist, I'm taking a lot of United Methodist liberal, uh, I'm, you know, I'm gonna sprinkle this with a lot of United Methodism today. I, Barbara told me that was my job, so yeah. <laughs> These are the words in our United Methodist baptismal ritual used to welcome newly baptized individuals into the kingdom of God in the community of a local congregation. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation. Now here's the part I really want you to get. You should write this part down. And made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. And made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus with joy and thanksgiving. We welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Now, the prophet Isaiah was reminding Israel that they were chosen to be a light to the nations. It was a, it's a powerful reminder to each of us that we have been chosen as God's servants, as lights to the nations, as missionaries to the world, to offer restoration, hope, justice, healing, blessing, transformation, and to be ambassadors of all things that are made new. And here is the really incredible thing. I'm sure you caught these words from Isaiah. God called you and me before we were born. Now that's just a flat out mystery. The prologue to uh, Ephesians affirms this. Paul writes that while we were yet in our mother's womb, we were called by, by God. That before the foundation of the world was set in motion, psh, by God. God already had in God's mind and heart that you and I would be a part of the royal priesthood. Pretty incredible, huh? Pretty incredible. And we were given a name. Now I know we all have names that we use, but uh, you know, the name we were given is not Bruce or Barbara or Kathy or Samuel or Judy, the name, did you catch this? Were you paying attention? The name was servant. We were knitted together in the womb, chosen by God, named by God to be servants with a purpose, to bring people back to God, to be harbingers of hope, to offer the world peace and justice. I love the way that it is recorded for us in First Peter. Listen to these Powerful words, you know these. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become his people so that, watch for the so that's, so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. So, your name is servant of the Lord. Your name is servant of the Lord. Samuel, your name is servant of the Lord. So I want, I know, I know uh, we just did pass the peace, but I want you to take a moment and uh, just do this again. But this time I want you to greet each other with your new name or, or what your original name was. So just introduce each, yourself to each other and say, hello, my name is servant of the Lord. Will you do that? All right, you can stand up, you can mill around. Hello, my name is servant of the Lord. So friends, uh, this is exactly this is exactly what we affirm in baptism. You were made, I was made, to share in Christ's royal priesthood, to be a servant of the Lord. So that, and I love this uh, phrase from uh, Genesis when 
God calls Abram, so that all the families of the earth will be blessed. So that all the families of the earth will be blessed. A few of you in this room uh, know a bit of my uh, personal history, and you know that when I married uh, my wife, Shar, 38 years ago, I became a father and a husband the same day. I wouldn't recommend it, but it worked out for us pretty well. Shar had been married before. Her first uh, husband was killed in a canoeing accident on the Red River in Fargo, North Dakota. He went over a little flood control dam, got caught in the undertow when his canoe capsized, and Part of the tragedy of that day is uh, this young mother and, and two young boys, two young sons were on the river bank and for 20, 25 minutes watched their husband and father drowned as they tried to rescue him. Um, Shar and I were uh, matched by a uh, meddler, someone who was meddling in our lives, <laughs> uh, a couple of years after that. And uh, as... God would have it. Shar fell madly in love with me, and we decided to be married. So I, I, just, I just had to give you the brief. I can't tell you the whole story, but that's really what happened. Okay. So shortly after uh, we were married, we began to have conversations about my adopting Lance and Stuart. Now, we wanted to go slow with this because <clears throat> we knew that we were asking them to make quite an adjustment in their life. And Lance, by this time, was uh, seven, and... Uh, excuse me, uh, Stuart was uh, four years old. And we were asking them to change their name from Henning, pretty good Anglo-Saxon name, to O. Not something you just voiced on children right away, you know. <laughs> so we took our very first uh, family vacation, and we went and saw their uh, biological uh, father's parents and my parents and Shar's mother. Her father was dead by this time, so that we could seek their blessing. Everybody thought it was a good idea to go forward with the adoption. So we found ourselves in a large, empty courtroom in Fargo, North Dakota, at the end of an adoption process, and the judge put me in the witness stand, and he gave me an oath, and then he asked me questions about my willingness to care for the children physically and spiritually. I gave him all the right answers. He signed the papers. Now, while this was going on, Lance, who is even in his early 40s now, a very pensive young man, sat on the front bench and just drank it all in. Every word, didn't move. Stuart, who is, as I told you, four years old, and um, marched to the beat of a different drummer, still does, he was running all over the courtroom. He was running across the benches, sliding across the benches, sliding under the benches, running up and down the aisles. He didn't have any, a clue what was going on. He just thought this was a great big playroom. Well, the very last thing the judge uh, did at the end of that, um, uh, that adoption proceeding was to read the new legal names. Lance Feldner O. Stuart Glenn O. And it just echoed around that empty courtroom. Well, we spill out in the hallway, we're on our way home, and Stuart comes uh, running to me and he says, Daddy, Daddy, and I gathered him up in my arms. He said, Daddy, Daddy, I have a new name. And I said, yes, I know. And he said, Glenn. <laughs> he had never heard his name pronounced with such authority. And he thought what happened that day in that courtroom is he was given a new middle name, Glenn. <laughs> Well, actually, he's named after his <clears throat> biological uh, father's father, his grandfather. What struck me at the time and um, still strikes me when I retell this story, which I've told many times, is that somewhere, somewhere in the process of our forming a new family, Stuart already knew he was an O. He just didn't know he was a, a Glenn. He'd already taken my surname long before we got there. He just didn't realize he had a middle name. Now, this story has a point. Some of you are saying, is he going to get to the point? It's a long story. <laughs> Friends, this is exactly how it is with God's love. There comes that moment in every one of our lives when we, when we get it, 
When we say, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Daddy, when we leap into God's arms and we say, I now understand who I am. I know that from the very beginning I was chosen and I have already taken your name. It's exactly what happens when we allow ourselves to run and jump into God's arms and acknowledge that we know who we are, that we've been chosen to be a servant of the Lord. You know, being chosen and named and called by God is synonymous with being sent. When this sank into my mind and heart when I was in college, I understood I, could, I was going to be a pastor because I knew I could not be named and chosen without being sent. And chosen for a purpose, sent for a purpose. You all know that the word mission is a Latin form of the Greek verb to send. A person in mission, therefore, is someone who is sent. A person who is called by God, named by God, is a sent person. You can't escape being sent if you desire to follow the Christ. You can't escape being sent if you have been baptized into Christ's royal priesthood. To be sent is to trust and be totally dependent on Jesus, the one who sends us. The greatest reward for a Christian submitted to God's calling is to be used by God or to be sent by God to accomplish God's purposes. The greatest reward for a Christian is to make one's entire life a gift to God. The greatest reward for a Christian is to live into the image of God, the image and purposes in, in which we were created and to which we are sent. Now, many of the United Methodists in the group will know this, but so this is for the rest of us. It may be a reminder. One of the great, great moments in the life of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist revival in England that spread to this country and ultimately around the world, is when he came to that moment when one of his colleagues, George Whit Whitfield, invited him to Bristol to see what he was doing preaching outdoors in the fields. So Wesley makes the trip to Bristol, sees Whitville standing on a little knoll, preaching to 30,000 people, mostly miners from the mines around Bristol. And um, Wesley was convicted. And he wrote in his journal, he says, you know, my, I would rather go with my preferences. You know, you know what his preferences were? To preach in the mighty, high, lifted up, pulpits of the great cathedrals of the Church of England. But he ultimately said that he was going to go with God's purposes, not his preferences. And he wrote in his journal that today he's re he said, I'm resolved to be more vile. I'm resolved to be more vile. Oh, Lord, if you would just raise up in our seminaries people who want to be more vile. That's my prayer every day. Send me the leaders who want to be more vile, that are willing to lay aside their preferences for whatever God's purposes are for their life so that they would live fully into what it means to be a servant of the Lord, to be a light to the nations, no matter what the cost, no matter what they have to set aside, no matter what all their preferences are, no matter where they feel comfortable or not comfortable. Let them lay it aside and become more vile. You see, this is when the twin spires of the Methodist movement of personal holiness and social holiness really came together. Because John Wesley's message when he began to preach in the fields and the docks and in the mines was one of personal conversion. But you see, he was doing it out of a social consciousness that said you have to go where the people are. And you have to accept the people at the places they are in their journey. This is what fueled the, the Methodist movement. And what will fuel it again? Ah, now, I'm not, now I'm starting partisan, aren't I? This is what will fuel revival no matter what faith tradition we come out of. The evangelist Tony Campalo tells a story that some of you have heard or read of a woman named Nancy who came to understand that she was called and named by God as a servant sent to offer God's grace to others. Nancy uh, has a handicapping condition and is confined to a wheelchair, and yet she has an extraordinary ministry. She understands herself to be a servant of the Lord. 
And every week in the personal section of her local newspaper, she runs an ad that reads, and I want to quote this, if you are lonely or have a problem, call me. I'm in a wheelchair and I seldom get out. We can share our problems with each other. I'd love to talk. And she spends much of her day on the telephone talking with more than 30 lonely and discouraged people who call her every week. When Campalo asked how she came to be confined to a wheelchair, Nancy revealed that she had tried to commit suicide by jumping from the balcony of her apartment. But instead of killing herself, she ended up in a hospital room, paralyzed from the waist down. And she said, one night, one night, Jesus came to me, she said, early in the morning and clearly said, you have had a healthy body and a crippled soul. From this day on, you will have a crippled body, but you will have a healthy soul. And she said, I gave my life to Jesus that night in that hospital room, and I knew that if I kept a healthy soul, a grateful soul, a thankful soul, it would mean that I would have to help other people, and so I do, she says. Isn't it mind-blowing who God calls and how God calls? I mean, just look around this room. Huh? Huh? I wouldn't send most of you to seminary. <laughs> but God called you. It's amazing who God calls and how God calls. It is totally amazing. It's perplexing and it is mysterious. Who God calls to be a blessing to others, to be a light to the nation, to be sent, to be sent as a servant of the Lord. You see, no one who has been chosen by God can remain silent. This is where you're supposed to say amen. amen. Kathy was trying to <laughs> encourage you to. No one who has experienced the grace of God can close their hearts to others, right, Samuel? Isn't that right? No one who has run and leapt into God's arms and shouted, Abba, Abba, I have a new name, can hold back. No one who has been baptized by water and the Spirit can do anything less than join God in making all things new and becoming a blessing to others. No one who has glimpsed God's dream can sit on their hands and do nothing. No one who hears in their heart God's call to service can do anything less than respond with thanksgiving and say, here I am, I will go, send me. Send me. No. no one who has encountered the living God can do anything less than say, I get it. I know my name. It is served. Send me. Send me. Send me to where you want me to be. Where you want me to serve. And let me be free of my purposes for the sake of your purposes. Send me. Maybe so. Amen.